Welcome to Deloitte's Debrief Tax Webcast in Asia Pacific. Our webcast today is from our Corporate Income Tax Series and is titled M&A and Carve Strategy in China and India. My name is Devi Manohar and I am a tax partner based in Deloitte, India. I have the pleasure of hosting today's webcast. <clears throat> I have uh, three speakers with me today: Jean Lu, <clears throat> Bimal Modi, and Tarun Soneja. Jean is a tax director based in Deloitte, China. Bimal is an FA partner, and he leads the transaction services practice in India, as well as the end-to-end M&A practice. <clears throat> Tarun is a consulting director, also based in Deloitte, India. You may access our bios on the left side of the screen. <clears throat> Before I introduce the agenda for today's webcast, I would like to take a moment to highlight some of the features of our webcast console. First, all users are on listen-only mode. If you have any content-related questions, you can submit at any time in the Q and A box at the bottom right of the screen. We'll do our best to respond to your questions during the presentation. Second, all PC users can maximize or minimize each box at your convenience during the webcast. You may also explore the icons at the bottom of the screen. If you want to download today's slides and related publications, please go to the downloads and links box. On the other hand, mobile device users can view the slides and answer the survey on the screen. Thirdly, if you require an attendance record for this event, you can download your CPE certificate by clicking the Request CPE icon at the bottom of the webcast console. Uh, now, I'll, let me give you an overview of the topics that we'll discuss today. <clears throat> uh, first, we'll talk about market trends, both global and markets for India and China. This will be taken by Bimal and Tarun. Second, after that, we'll go to the outline of tax aspects in the carve-outs in India, uh, and this will be taken by me. And uh, then after that, we will go to Jean, who will take uh, uh, you know uh, an outline of tax aspects in carve-outs in China. After that, we'll have uh, time for a few questions and answers. Now, <clears throat> let me pass on uh, to Bimal and Tarun for market trends. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Manohar. Um, welcome everybody and good afternoon, good, good evening for some of the folks who are in the rest of the Asia Pacific. Um, thank you um, for joining the call today. Um, before we sort of dive into the sort of the trends and uh, growth in India, China and globally, and look at all the various different aspects, especially tax, I'd just like to sort of give some context around what's happening in the world, right? Today, I mean, M&A has been uh, an acquisitions, M&A, large corporate acquisitions have been the feature of many a deals. But the trend we've been seeing, especially in the last couple of years and the recent past, is divestures, right? And divestures are becoming very, very, very popular. Uh, why is that, right? And you see some of the largest corporations around the world uh, going through a process of divesting. Uh, part of it is general shareholder activism, right? So where shareholders are getting very discerning around the value uh, they're getting out of companies. And by that I mean is large is beautiful was the old kind of traditional way of looking at it. The bigger the organization, the better we can uh, weather all kinds of storm. Uh, but now what people are thinking about is actually being a large diversified organization is not always good, right? Having too many activities, too many businesses, non-core businesses especially, takes away the focus of the management, right? Management get time, capital allocation, gets distributed, which means shareholders are not getting the value from the relevant companies. So we're seeing a, a huge amount of trend globally where some of the largest corporations, which were kind of a conglomerates, had multiple businesses, are now shrinking or selling off some of the businesses. So just name a few, like IBM, like GE, Toshiba, JNJ, &J, all of these organizations are going through a divestor process or carve out of some of the non-core businesses. And the surveys and the kind of uh, you know press and, and the articles we read, this is only going to get more and more, right? As shareholders and CEOs look at focusing on the core businesses right? and spending time with their core businesses, which adds value. Um, even in India, right, as we just speak, um, we've seen many a transactions where car outs are taking place. Just hot the press is, and everybody's been following through, especially Asia, is City selling off its 
retail business, right? So City is selling off its retail businesses across AP and just announced yesterday that they are exiting the retail business and there'll be a carve out of the retail businesses of the large city business, right? Um, so this is just one example of another large uh, corporate getting rid of some of their non-core businesses as they perceive it sort of uh, drags the shareholder value. Um, so um, this is just a set of a context. It's, it's happening. We'll see more and more great opportunity for Deloitte to play in the entire cycle of helping companies carve out businesses, non-core businesses, and help them with coming up with the transition agreements, right, as and when they need. Um, let me just give pass it on to Tarun, who will go deeper into some of the, the market trends in the two geographies that we just speak about, India, China, um, and, and, and focus more on why this is happening uh, and how this happens, and, and walk you through some of the case studies as well, right, how we can help um, and some of the issues both from tax and non-tax perspective. Um, so Tarun, over to you to, to walk us through some of the your experience and what you're seeing globally. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Bimal. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, as was introduced, uh, my name is Tarun Suneja. I'm a director in the, uh, in the M&A consulting practice uh, at India and uh, have been working in this space for the last uh, about 17 years, uh, helping my, my clients go through either large-scale integrations or carve-outs. And uh, I'll just build upon some of the, the trends that uh, the previous presenter, Bimal, uh, spoke about. Uh, Last year, we last year we we conducted a survey of around twelve hundred uh, about thirteen hundred executives across uh, large corporations and and private equity players, and to to look at you know what are the the M and A trends the um, the trends around cowards and divestitures, and what we observed was that nearly ninety percent of that entire uh, senior executive uh, base had witnessed either a carve out in the last twelve months or were actually going through. Uh, a carve out at, at at that given point of time, so nearly ninety percent of organizations that we polled were, were going through a carve out transaction. In fact, that's a that's a trend which has also been significantly enhanced during the pandemic time. If you look at the the graph on the right hand side, um, there are acquisitions, there are alternatives to acquisitions like alliances, JVs, um, partnerships. But if you look at divestitures, which has been pointed out in the in the red box. You will see that in the during the time of the pandemic between 2019 and 21, there has been a significant uptick in the actual num actual number of divestitures that have that have happened, both from a value perspective as well as from a, a volume perspective. And I'll I'll go a little bit deeper into into some of the reasons that that have have uh, pushed this growth. But as a trend, uh, this divestitures has been on a significant rise over the next last couple of years, and that trend is also expected to continue. At a global level, um, you'll see on the next page, uh, uh, the the U.S. is the largest U.S. is the largest market uh, region in terms of where divestitures are happening, followed by, uh, by 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 China and and the U.K. In terms of the overall uh, overall market, the uh, the uh, divestitures contributed to a nearly nearly two trillion worth uh, of, of in terms of value in terms of the divestitures that happened last year. Uh, and this has been the the highest that has ever been in the last several years in terms of of, of corporate activity in this space. Uh, last year itself, the the carve-out space witnessed about a thirty five percent increase over the previous year, which was also an increase over over, over the year before. One of the major uh, conversations and trends that we see around around M and and specifically around divestitures, both from a seller point of view as well as a buyer point of view, is the emergence of ESC as as a topic. And many um, uh, of the conversations are are focused around you know, what is the is the business has been sell, be being sold out, uh, what are they doing in in the space of ESG, and that's also used as a metric in terms of valuation of of potential buy uh, uh, of of potential companies to buy. In terms of the sectors, given the the large focus on uh, on digitization of creating digital landscapes, TMT as a sector, which is technology, media and technology, uh, and telecom have been uh, the core sectors where a lot of the, the cloud activities are happening, followed by the uh, globally by the FSI sector, which is a lot focused on building fintech solutions to support the digital transformation. So those are, are the key industries that are actually uh, pushing uh, you know, the, the entire cloud landscape. 
I'll go specifically into uh, into the China market followed by the India market or what are the, the overall trends there as well. So on the next page, you look at uh, what does the market, the covered landscape for China look like. In terms of the overall volumes, this was uh, close to $176 billion in terms of the uh, in terms of value uh, as far as the car votes go in the Chinese market. However, in the Chinese market, we've seen a, a slightly different trend compared to the region. Uh, there was a, a, a reduction in terms of the overall deal value. Uh, though the, 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 the number of deals by volume actually went up a little bit, but uh, in terms of the, the value, it, uh, it actually came down significantly over, uh, over the pandemic period. In fact, uh, deal size decreased. Um, so if you look at the overall value and the and the volume, uh, to look at the uh, actual deal average deal size, we saw that coming down significantly in the last uh, last two years by around twenty six percent. One of the the key uh, key trends in the Chinese market is the difference, and the difference globally is the amount of domestic car votes. So when you look at a car vote, there are there are uh, broadly two kinds of car votes. One are domestic, in which a company is is carving out uh, a business which is then being acquired by a, by a local player. Uh, that's what is was typically defined as a domestic car vote. And then there are there are cross border car votes where either uh, the business being carved out is 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 being purchased by an inbound investor coming from outside, or uh, as an organization, the uh, organization is going outside the country to go and acquire a carved out business. So in the Chinese market, there was a, there was a much larger focus on domestic car votes, which accounted for nearly ninety percent of all the deal activity in the last one year around, around car votes. In terms of sectors, the real estate sector um, uh, dominated diversified activity last year. Given the uh, the increased focus around regulation, a lot of the, co- lot of the large corporates were divesting uh, their businesses in the real estate segment. So that's the segment which, which saw significant diversified activity, followed by the energy and power and the industrial sector. So that's a broad uh, overview of what was happening in China. In contrast, in the in the Indian market, the second market that we'll cover today, on the next page, the, while the market were, is, is, is smaller, the overall car vote market size is about 26 billion in the last year. But this has seen a significant increase over the pandemic period. Uh, the average share of car votes in the larger MA space is about 45%. We, while we saw the, the the volume coming down, but the 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 average average deal size significantly increased between 2019 and 21, which means deals are are far more uh, larger and complex. Compared to the the Chinese market in the previous page, domestic car votes uh, accounted for about 67 percent of deal activity, and 33 percent of the deal activity was actually cross border, with a majority of those. Um, of multinational companies coming into the Indian market and acquiring covered businesses, which accounted for about 27% out of the 33% of cross, cross-border deal activity. In terms of the um, of the countries that we're looking at, uh, which are most active, it was, it was the US, Japan, and Singapore, which accounted for nearly half of all the inbound carve-outs happening in the, in the Indian market. Uh, on the next page, I'll, I'll talk about some of the the drivers that has 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 uh, has caused uh, for this activity. So, uh, four key drivers uh, are are responsible for pushing up the carboard activity. The first one on the like you see on the table on the right hand side is the is the entire requirement around around infusion of capital. Uh, given the time of the pandemic, there was uh, a lot of focus on on building and bringing in new capital, also uh, improving the balance sheets in terms of paying off debt. So those are the, the were two key drivers, followed by a lot of focus across every industry to relook at what is the core business and what is non-core. So restructuring of the portfolio around, around core business areas was something that was driving across the industries uh, the covered activity. Specifically in the in the energy sector, a lot of activity was, was witnessed around, um, around the newer emerging areas, for example, on on renewables, on on nuclear, on on wind power, solar, which was driving a lot of the MA activity and specifically cowed activity as well. Uh, TMT and and financial services, like I mentioned, uh, were driven by the need around digitization, around the development of fintech solutions to support that uh, that growth. Uh, sectors that that contributed the most in the cowed activity have been, and this is specifically in India, 
have been energy, industrial manufacturing, and construction. And these, like you can imagine, are the core industrial sectors. Um, you know, because a lot of focus was in terms of looking at at the at what is core to their business, and and therefore carving out some of the peripheral businesses around around the core. So this is a, a, an overview of of how the cowed activity was split across various sectors. I'll uh, I'll now take uh, take a few minutes to walk you through one of a, a large case study of a, of a of a company that we worked very closely with, as they were looking to carve out. Uh, a large multi-organization, multi-country uh, kind of a business uh, uh, business unit uh, across various countries, various geographies, and various operations. Uh, and this this company was uh, was was divesting uh, a, a part of the business which is about about fifteen percent of the overall overall business. Uh, and this included multiple countries, it included about five plants and and shared service hubs in in uh, in Asia, in Europe, and the Americas region. Um, what we witnessed in, and as as is the case in any large uh, um, carve out, is that there is a significant uh, uh, areas of of dependence of cross dependencies on on the wider organization. So carving out those dependencies, either either through building uh, separate standalone solutions or 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 new transition services agreements, was one of the core areas uh, where we worked on in, on this engagement. Uh, from a from a tax and a, and, and a regulatory perspective, when you carve out uh, such a complex organization across countries, we have to look at you know what are are, are the new um, uh, say for example cross border payments that are required because all of that brings in in various uh, tax related aspects. You know when when the organization is still a part of the of the parent, a lot of these payments are internal, but when you become a third party organization, you have to take into consideration the local laws around taxation, uh, local regulatory uh, rules. And then again, how do you how do you cross in uh, send invoices? Because there, then there would be uh, issues around around transfer pricing, around related party transactions, which have to be have to be catered for. So so that's so those are all some of the aspects that we we looked at while we were executing this 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 um, uh, this carve out. One of the other areas was um, uh, setting up of of individual or independent contracts. And um, during a carve out, there are close to uh, you know hundreds of contracts that. That are are uh, with the parent organization, which need to be relooked at either from a novation perspective or a reassignment perspective, and each of these contracts then bring in a significant uh, dependency from a tax perspective as well. Of you know how do you how do you take into consideration the local requirements in every country where new contracts are being set up? Uh, so I think these are some of the considerations that that uh, we looked at when we executed this last transaction. So I think I'll, I'll stop here and um, I'll pass it back to, to Manohar to look at some of the more specific tax issues uh, while executing carve-outs. And I'll be happy to take a few questions at the at the end. Thank you, Manohar, Tarun think... and Bimal. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so we will now uh, talk about specific tax issues uh, that may arise uh, in carve-outs in India. Uh, and after me, like I said, uh, Jean will talk about the China issues. So in India, <clears throat> you know, there are several ways in which uh, we could do carve outs. Uh, there is a demerger, there is a slum sale, uh, there is an itemized sale, which is a variation of the slum sale. Uh, there is acqui hires, which have become quite popular uh, in, in the technology sector, especially startups. And of course, uh, the share purchases. Uh, these are uh, these are the ways in which uh, carve-outs are done in India, and uh, we'll talk about each of these in the next slide. <clears throat> so the first uh, is demerger. <clears throat> this works, uh, you know, uh, in in a couple of ways, uh, and all carve-outs are similar, right? We first move out a business or uh, you know particular undertaking into another company, which is either sold to a new buyer or we demerge a business into a company which is owned by the buyer already. Both of these are possible. A demerger is a court-driven process. Uh, it is an approval-driven process where uh, we would, uh, the, the transferring company would transfer a business into another entity. And uh, the entity which receives the business is called a resulting company. That, that entity issues shares as consideration to the shareholders of the transferor entity. This is uh, tax neutral, a demerger. Uh, there is no income tax. 
there is no GST on the transfer, uh, but there are conditions to the demerger. Uh, the conditions are that all property belonging and liabilities of the business have to be transferred. Uh, and consideration for this should only be shares, right? <clears throat> and the third one is that uh, at least 75% of the shareholders uh, of the transferor entity have to uh, receive shares uh, on a proportionate basis in the uh, resulting company. <clears throat> so if, uh, if we are able to do it this way, uh, any losses, you know, any brought forward or uh, NOLs, which were there in the demerged company, uh, are transferred on a proportionate basis into the resulting company, or if they are directly relatable to the business, they are transferred uh, entirely into the new entity. Similarly, with uh, any GST, uh, you know, balances, accruals, etc., those also get transferred along with the undertaking. <clears throat> the cost that is incurred in a demerger, while it is tax neutral, so income tax and GST do not apply. Uh, there are municipal taxes uh, depending on which state. Uh, the, the entity is registered. Uh, that, that is called stamp duty in India. In some cases, stamp duty could also be high. So that is something that we will have to look at. <clears throat> uh, demerger is a long drawn process in India. It requires approvals from uh, uh, several authorities. Uh, it requires, uh, you know, it goes through a court process. So we are seeing in the pandemic era uh, that a demerger takes about 10 to 12 months for an unlisted private company. If it is a listed entity, then the time taken is lo longer. Uh, having said that, there are several instances in the last two years in India where demerger has been a, a, a preferred process uh, in a carve out, largely because of uh, the income tax and GST exemptions available. <clears throat> the second way of doing it uh, is a slump sale, which is a business transfer. Uh, so, uh, you know, business transfer. Uh, in, in that sense is reasonably simple. Uh, the slump sale is a defined term under the income tax. <clears throat> uh, it is basically transfer of a going concern along with all assets and liabilities of the business uh, for a single price. So we do not attribute specific prices to assets or liabilities and uh, we transfer all of the assets and liabilities related to the business. If uh, we are able to do it in this way, it is called a slump sale. <clears throat> There are some uh, efficiencies and uh, there is ease of doing this uh, from an income tax perspective. Uh, it is, however, taxable. So uh, tax will be paid on a transfer of business. Now, uh, the tax depends upon the rate of tax, depends upon how long the business was carried on. If it was carried on for at least 36 months, uh, the tax rate is 20%. Uh, but if it is uh, carried on for lesser than that, uh, then it is at the regular corporate tax rate depending upon uh, what is the headline tax rate for the company. It could be 22 to 30%, uh, <clears throat> depending on the choice uh, that the company has made around the taxes it pays. Uh, <clears throat> can we move on to the next slide? So along with this, uh, uh, business transfer or going concern transfer uh, does not involve uh, GST. There's no GST payable on that. Uh, Again, if there are uh, any immovable properties, land, building being transferred, there could be additional municipal taxes also. Uh, having said that, there are no approvals required here. <clears throat> so this does not require prior uh, you know, approvals such as court, et cetera. There could, however, be uh, requirements uh, for license transfers. Uh, <clears throat> and those would depend on the nature of business. So uh, if there are any licenses or special benefits that the company is uh, claiming or the business is claiming, those we would have to see whether they need prior approval or they need post approval. There are certain approvals which may be required from an income tax and GST perspective. Sorry, it's not an approval. It is uh, no objection. Um, uh, but this would depend uh, from case to case. <clears throat> Uh, there is a change, a significant change uh, in income tax uh, effective 1st April 21. Uh, you know, prior to 1st April 21, uh, if, uh, you know, the slump sale or the business purchase was done at a premium over its net worth, uh, that premium would be recorded as goodwill from an accounting perspective. And that goodwill uh, was a depreciable asset for income tax purposes. This was based on a Supreme Court judgment, which is the apex court of the country. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, there was a significant benefit available at a 25% depreciation rate 
you would effectively uh, write down the goodwill for tax purposes over a five year period. Uh, but from 1st April 21, uh, goodwill, now the law very specifically says that goodwill is not a depreciable item. So any premium that we pay, there would be no step up available, uh, ex, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the goodwill, uh, you know, uh, from income tax. Uh, having said that, <clears throat> if we are acquiring certain other intangibles, such as in intellectual property or, uh, uh, or even contracts, right, those uh, we could get a step up. Uh, when we do a purchase price allocation, those could still be depreciable. So this is something that we would have to see on what benefits we may be able to claim on uh, acquiring a business. <clears throat> uh, because this is a business transfer, any losses that were available in the transferor entity uh, you know, will not be available to the transferee entity. Uh, the slump sale uh, is, is, uh, is quite preferred in terms of uh, you know, carve-outs because it is quick and it does not involve approvals from authorities. So uh, we have seen this to be quite a popular way of doing business. Uh, and this takes about a couple of months, largely dependent upon uh, you know, what documentation is required. And in some situations, if there were bank loans, uh, et cetera, there could be certain approvals that may be needed. But uh, this is, this is uh, quite an efficient and effective way of doing it also. The other way of doing <clears throat> the next is uh, an itemized sale. Uh, itemized sale is also a business transfer, but uh, the difference there is, uh, you know, uh, the seller and the buyer can choose to transfer only specific assets uh, and only specific liabilities. <clears throat> so uh, it does not have to be a going concern. It could be uh, just assets or just people uh, or some assets and some people. Uh, relating to that. And, uh, uh, you know, that is called an itemized sale to distinguish it from the slump sale that uh, I just mentioned. <clears throat> so in that situation, in an itemized sale, uh, uh, you know, whatever the buyer pays, right, is again taxable for the seller, but uh, the tax would apply on individual asset basis, right? So every asset we would have to compute, uh, you know, whether there is a gain, and if there is any additional goodwill, uh, <clears throat> that any or, or rather any premium, that is taxable for the uh, for the seller. <clears throat> so uh, the tax again depends upon the nature of the asset, and uh, uh, you know whatever the premium was. Uh, there are different uh, tax rates applicable if it is uh, uh, if it is uh, immovable property such as land. Uh, the tax rate is different uh, compared to, say, uh, assets which were depreciated. So, therefore, there would be different rates of tax. Uh, the additional thing is that GST would apply on all of the assets that are transferred. Any property or any goods that are transferred, except for land and building, uh, there, uh, you know, uh, GST applies. Now, the highest rate of GST is 18% but uh, it would depend on the nature of asset transfer to identify what the GST uh, you know, applicability would be. Now, <clears throat> GST generally what we've seen is that if the, if the buyer is able to claim credit so the, uh, on, on uh, the GST applied on these, uh, then uh, it is neutral because uh, you know, while GST is collected, uh, it is set off. The only thing is there will be additional cash required in this whole transaction. Right? because uh, our GST will be on top of the purchase price. That is, <clears throat> so this is how uh, itemized sale works. Now we have seen itemized sale also uh, being preferred in certain situations where uh, maybe the buyer is not very comfortable with uh, you know, the entire business being transferred. Maybe there could be some liabilities they do not want to take over. We've seen uh, situations where um, uh, you know, the value is derived only from certain aspects of the business, while the other aspects could lead to buyer negotiating or asking for indemnities. So in those situations, an itemized sale may probably work better, while the seller may have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, do or pay tax uh, in a more complex manner. That's what we've seen. Uh, <clears throat> can we go to the next slide? <clears throat> So again, for the itemized sale, there is no, uh, there's no approvals. Uh, it, is, uh, it is more internal, it's more based on documentation. 
So it takes about a couple of months. No approvals, no court approvals required here. Uh, the only thing again is if there is, uh, you know, there are some licenses or other approvals from banks required, those would continue, right? And the timeline would primarily depend upon those. <clears throat> Uh, another way we've seen, uh, uh, you know, carve-outs happening is acquihire. <clears throat> uh, so acquihires uh, have been popular in technology companies, which are primarily driven by uh, people. <clears throat> and uh, there have been two kinds of acquihires we've seen. One is where there are uh, global uh, service centers, GCCs in India. Uh, and we've seen some, uh, you know, a, a buyer taking over the entire process and the contract from the seller. So in that case, they would just, uh, you know, they would just cancel the contract, transfer all the people to the new entity and do a new contract in that entity. If that is the situation, then, uh, you know, on the transfer itself, because in, uh, you can't transfer people in India in that sense, uh, you could, uh, they resign and they join a new organization. Unless there's a consideration paid, uh, there is generally no tax in people resigning and joining a new entity. Having said that, <clears throat> what we've seen is when, when there's a mass hiring of people, uh, the buyer entity uh, also kind of uh, works up uh, and comes up with ways of retaining the people uh, that are joining because it's a new organization. Uh, and that retention could be monetary. Uh, in a lot of situations, there could be certain ESOPs that are offered. There could be certain bonuses for uh, you know working in the company for a certain period of time, et cetera. And that is where there could be some structuring required because all of these, uh, there are implications both for the company as well as for the employee. So that is one area where uh, we've spent some time. Uh, uh, like I said, any consideration in this, uh, if it is paid, that is taxable for the uh, entity which is transferring the employees. However, uh, you know, otherwise, if there is no consideration paid, there would be uh, no tax on and timeline, again, uh, it is effectively based on uh, uh, the, the only time required here is in the social security, uh, you know, balances that the employees have, uh, what, whatever time it may take, right? And contracts relating to the employee offers. <clears throat> the, the other way of, uh, of doing uh, uh, this thing, of a uh, uh, carve out, is where we have done a transfer right, into a new entity, and that entity is then transferred to a third party, right? Um, so share transfers, uh, you know, uh, very prevalent in India, very popular <clears throat> because uh, of two things. One is uh, these are uh, probably for a non-resident, uh, you know, buyer, probably the simplest way of doing it. Uh, but when is when there's a, there are share purchases, there are some issues or, uh, you know, considerations to keep in mind. The first is... <clears throat> Uh, you know, when we buy shares from uh, from a person, we would have to see whether we are buying from a resident Indian or a non-resident Indian, right? Uh, there are different rules uh, and regulations. So there is income tax as well as there are, uh, you know, uh, rules uh, by for exchange control in terms of valuation at which the, uh, the shares can be purchased. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, uh, uh, for income tax, what we would say is the buyer has to withhold taxes on the seller shareholders. Now, the withholding can happen <clears throat> either, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, on residents or non-residents. The rates of tax are different, and uh, the complications around uh, these could be different. Uh, we've also seen that if there are non-resident sellers who are invested uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in, in, uh, from Mauritius or Singapore, there could be certain exemptions. We would have to examine whether those exemptions are available uh, from a buyer perspective because the buyer is liable as a withholder. <clears throat> then, uh, uh, you know, um, I already talked about taxation. Uh, for the seller, the uh, sale of shares is taxable. If it is a non-resident holding shares for more than 24 months, the tax rate is 10%. Uh, but if uh, shares are held for less than 24 months, the tax rate is as high as 40% for a non-resident. Right, so uh, that can have a big bearing on when the seller may want to sell. <clears throat> uh, there are certain valuation requirements, like I said, both under Indian Income Tax as well as uh, uh, Companies Act and as well as uh, the foreign exchange. So we've seen that gets a little complicated in terms of the exact price that is agreed and the valuation that uh, we will have to arrive at 
to ensure that we are meeting with compliances uh, under various regulations. One additional thing I would like to talk about is indirect transfer. <clears throat> indirect transfer uh, is uh, uh, a situation where uh, in a global carve out, uh, shares of an entity outside India are being transferred. But uh, as part of the entire business, uh, that entity, the, the foreign entity, owns shares in an Indian company. Uh, and the way India defines indirect transfer is if uh, the value of the Indian company is at least 50% or more of the global transaction value. Uh, that leads to taxation in India uh, as an indirect transfer. Uh, that is valuation driven uh, and there are arithmetic tests on how this could be done. But this is an important uh, area where if India, you know, we've seen many situations where, uh, you know, global organizations have very large India presence. And indirect transfer becomes a, a, a very big uh, area of concern or area of focus for uh, the global transaction because the taxation could be quite high, right? Like I said, either uh, 11, 10% or 40%. So that is something that we would have to make sure that we are complying with. <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, uh, share transfers in India, the timelines are, again, uh, not too long. They're short take about two to three months. Uh, the only requirement is, uh, you know, uh, we will need to do certain valuations. We will need to do certain tax filings in India prior to the sale, but all of those can be managed. The time is generally dependent upon how long it takes for the uh, uh, documentation. <clears throat> so these, uh, if, uh, can we move on to the next? <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> so other some of the important areas we've seen uh, in a carve out uh, and I've uh, kindly uh, briefly alluded to them. Licenses, if there are any licenses, uh, you know, or if there are any tax benefits being claimed, we will have to make sure that those transfer in the uh, in the carve out, right? <clears throat> uh, second is, if there are any borrowing from foreign entities in the carved out business, those may need prior approval of uh, the Reserve Bank of India. And we've seen any prior approval from Reserve Bank of India takes, uh, takes time. <clears throat> um, Third one is people transfer. There are several uh, laws that need to be kind of kept in mind and we need to uh, make sure that balances in social security are transferred. Uh, and the last one is immigrated related issues. If uh, there are uh, employees who are deputed outside India uh, to make sure that their visas are still valid. Yeah, so these are the uh, areas we'll need to keep in mind. Uh, I'm done with the India tax uh, and I'll pass on to Jean, uh, my colleague on the China tax. Yeah, thank you, Manaha. I'm Jean, Tax Director of Deloitte China Banking Office. I'm specialized in M&A and International Tax Service. It's a pleasure to talk about our observation of the carve-out transactions in China market. Yeah, while the overall M&A market fluctuates according to the changing economic environment, as well as the pandemic situation, we still see carve-out cases emerged in China, boosted by new regulations, especially in certain segments. In mainland China, over 70 listed companies have announced their carve-out plan since the introduction of new Asia separate listing rule. With the blooming rates market, we also see more carve-out transactions in this area. There are similar trends in the Hong Kong share exchange, and there have been quite a few landmark transactions like spin-off of JD Group to list its uh, logistic business. The Chinese international company NetEase also spins off its music streaming operator. And BYD, which is a Chinese auto giant, is applying to spin off its semiconductor unit. Yet in the next page, you will see typical approaches of carve-out transactions we observe in China. Typically, a carve-out transaction could be executed in China by way of spin off, asset deal, share deal, reverse carve-out, and indirect transfer. These concepts are quite common and are similar to the definition of the transactions in most of other jurisdictions, while the tax treatments of different approaches vary a lot in China. Yet for some transactions, you may find interestingly the treatments are conceptually similar to the same type of transactions in India. And there are also some specific points to note, especially in some specific industry. We'll then move to the next slide to more detail, for more details about the tax treatments of these approaches. Let's first look at the spin-off approach, which is quite commonly seen in carve-out transactions. With the spin-off approach, an independent new company will be set up, 
through the split of an existing entity in order to hold the capital business. And the gain of the existing company derived from the transferring of the capital business would be subject to 25% income tax. Yet having said so, a special tax treatment called special reorganization may be applied with certain conditions. If all the original shareholders of the spun-off entity receive an equity interest in the newly set up entity based on the original shareholding percentage, and the business operation of both the spun-off entity and the new entity remain unchanged, provided that the equity consideration received by the original shareholder is not less than 85% of the total consideration, the parties could elect to apply the special tax treatment. With a special tax treatment, no tax would be paid in the spin-off transaction, and the cost base of the asset and liabilities being transferred to the new company should equal their original tax base. That means any taxes related to the transaction would be deferred to future disposal. And the income tax attribute, the income tax attributes attributable to the spin-off assets should carry over to the new company. And the tax laws attributable to such assets should be carried over to, but on an apportioned basis. Yeah, however, there are also restrictions of adopting such of adopting such deferral tax treatment. For such transactions that special reorg adopted, the main shareholders receiving equity consideration cannot dispose this equity within 12 months. Otherwise, the deferred taxes would be claimed back upon the, upon the disposal. Well, the value-added tax may not be applied in a spin-off transaction if it is considered to be whole business transfer. A whole business transfer means to transfer the entire business assets, its associated liabilities and labor force by means of merger, division, or sale or replacement. Such transfer is out of China VAT scope. And we now look at another commonly adopted approach, asset due. In asset due, the seller would directly sell the cash voucher assets to the contemplated recipient. And the gain of the seller would be subject to 25% income tax. Special reorganization treatment may also apply to asset dues under certain conditions. But the conditions are somewhat different from the ones that we talked about in this, for the spin-off transactions. For example, tax deferral treatment could be adopted for intergroup assignment. Intergroup assignment is a very special type of intergroup transaction. It refers to assignment of assets between related companies that are 100% under the same control. And no profit or loss should be recognized from accounting perspective by each party of the transaction. If the material business operation of the assigned assets would remain unchanged for 12 months, the parties could elect to adopt the deferral treatment, which means no taxable gain would be recognized upon the transaction, and the tax base of the assets being transferred would be brought forward. There are also other types of asset transfers that could qualify, potentially qualify for special reorg, where at least 50% of the transferring entity's assets are acquired by the buying entity, and the equity consideration is at least 85% of the Total consideration or treatment may also apply. Yeah, similar to what discussed during the spin-off transaction, the original business operation of the transferred asset should remain unchanged for 12 months, and the main shareholder receiving equity consideration cannot dispose the equity consideration within 12 months. Otherwise, the deferred tax would be clawed back. Yeah, that, on the other hand, value-added tax usually would be applied. The VAT rates for ordinary VAT payers are generally 13% for tangible assets, 9% for real estate, and 6% for other intangibles. The VAT related for asset deal should be analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis. For example, if the assets, associated liabilities, and labor force of a business segment are transferred entire a uh, transfer together in an asset deal. There would be stronger arguments to apply the VAT exemption rule. But on the, on the contrary, when assets are transferred together with only selected liabilities, 
the exemption rule is less likely to apply. Yet, moreover, real estate property transfer tax would also be applied if the real estate property are involved in an asset deal. The related tax cost could go easily go up to over 50% of the realized profits. If that would be the case, the parties may consider to transaction with a different approach in order to manage the related cost. We can talk more about the real estate related taxes later. But before that, let's look at the share deal, which is relatively straightforward from tax perspective. For domestic sellers, 25% income tax would be, would be applied on their capital gains. And the rate for foreign entities is 10%. There is a limited number of treaties that could prevent China from charging income taxes on the disposition of companies' shares. And special reorganization may also apply to uh, share deal, where at least 50% of the equity interest of a company is acquired and the equity consideration is over 85% of the total consideration is quite similar to previous conditions we, dis we talked about. Deferral treatment could also apply. Again, there will be requirements to keep the business unchanged for 12 months and no disposal of the equity consideration in 12 months. Share deal is not subject to VAT. And moving on to the next slide, let's look at two more approaches that are relatively more complex in terms of China taxes. The reverse cover out refers to such a transaction that the existing company would dispose any out of scope uh, assets and liabilities to a new entity owned by the original shareholder. And the original shareholder would transfer the shares of the existing company to the contemplated buyer. Such approach normally would be seen in transactions involving real estate properties. In China, real estate properties transfer would be subject to land value added tax, LVAT, D tax, income tax, and value added tax. The appreciation of the land realized in the, pro in the transfer by the seller would be subject to LVAT at pro progressive rates ranging from 30% to 60%. Buyers of the real estate properties would also pay 3% to 5% D-tax, which is charged based on the gross value of such properties. Yet if we adding up 25% income tax on capital gain and 9% VAT on gross value, the overall tax liabilities related to the property transfer would easily go up to over 50% of realized profits. Yeah, as a result, reverse cap out are used for the purpose to avoid transferring of the real estate properties. Well, for the assets and liabilities that are reversely capped out, income tax and value added tax may be applied, just similar as what we discussed for asset deals. And the disposition of the shares of the remaining entity would also be subject to income tax, just as what we discussed for a share deal. An indirect transfer would also be applied in China. An indirect transfer would typically be seen in a global deal where the China division are transferred indirectly through selling of an offshore parent or indirect shareholder. Since the introduction of the first indirect rule in the year of 2008, the prevailing rule for indirect transfer, which is Bulletin 7, was announced in 2015. According to Bulletin 7, indirect transfer of Chinese taxable assets which also include the transfer of the shares of Chinese entity by non-resident companies that are lack of genuine business purpose may trigger 10% income tax in China. To determine, whether an indirect, to determine whether an indirect transfer has a bona fide business purpose, all the arrangements related to the indirect transfer should be taken into account, and there are specific factors to be considered. The key factors include whether the majority of the value of the offshore company's shares come from the China assets, whether its assets and revenue mainly comes from China, whether the function performed and risk assumed by the non-resident holding company can justify the economic substance of the organization structure, and the duration of the holding structure, and also whether the income tax is payable outside of China. 
Also, whether the business result of such indirect transfer can be commercially achieved or replaced by a direct transfer. And Bulletin 7 requires the buyer to act as a withholding agent for taxable transactions. When the buyer fails to withhold taxes and the seller does not declare the taxes by itself, the, seller, the buyer will be subject to penalty, which is calculated based on the amount of tax due. It will, however, on a voluntary basis, if the deal is reported to the tax authority within 30 days upon the signing of the SPA, such penalty can be reduced or relieved. Bulletin 7 also provides exceptions and safe harbor rule for certain transactions like normal trading of list cost shares, certain share swap uh, among intergroup companies, and transactions that could have been exempted from China based on the protection provided by the tax treaties. And no VAT will be applied on indirect transfer as share transfer is out of VAT scope in China. Now that we have talked through the key tax impacts of the typical carve-out approaches in China, it's important to know that there are also tax considerations in terms of the implementation operation. Let's look at the next page. One important component of the, of the implementation would be compliance procedures. For taxable events, taxpayers and the withholding agents are obliged to perform the related tax filings and registration. The reporting requirements of the indirect transfer are, also more, are even more complex. As such, the parties may wish to agree the filing strategy and their respective obligations in such a transaction in advance. And for certain transactions where special tax treatments are involved, such as special reorg, intergroup asset assignment, whole business transfer treatment, and etc., proper documentation to evidence that all the criteria are met should be prepared and submitted to the tax authority. And in terms of the operation, given that the cover out would normally lead to change of business model, the, the change in the operation as well as the, the administration of tax matters should also uh, be assessed. Normally, the company needs to pay attention to the current transfer pricing policy. Because of the change of the business model, the related policy and documentation may have to be renewed. There could be more intergroup transactions created due to the cap out. In order to ensure that the transactions are taken at arm's length principle, TP analysis may be needed and the transfer pricing documentation may need to be updated. It would, important, it, it would impo impact more to the companies that did not fall within the scope of, to prepare TP documentation prior to the cover out transaction. In some cases, preferential tax treatments that were previously applicable prior to the transactions may no longer be available. For example, the reduced uh, income tax rate would only be available uh, for high tax companies that meet threshold ratios. For example, the ratios of R&D staff, the ratios uh, of R&D expenses to total revenue, and the cover out may lead to significant changes to these ratios, and the sustainability of such preferential tax treatment are suggest to be assessed. And we also see challenges in HR and payroll support area. And uh, there could be tax impact related to the cost allocation in the, of this area. And last but not least, accounting and bookkeeping, including the administration of tax invoices, should also be managed properly. And in short, cover out tax transactions in China should, could be executed through different approaches, and the tax treatment are quite different. To ensure a smooth transaction, compliance requirements and implementation should also be carefully taken care of. Yeah, that's it for the tax China tax part. Thanks. I'll hand back to Manaha. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, we we have a few minutes for questions, and uh, since since we just finished China, uh, there's a question here, Jean. Uh, you know. Is there any difference in terms of timing for the different uh, approaches that you just uh, spoke about? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. If we take into consideration of various regulatory requirements, such as the renewal of company registration, and that would be 
the the timing of different approach could be quite different. Yeah, for example, asset deal, including asset deal in a reverse cap out, would normally be the fastest way because you just need to pick up the asset you want, and just to do it commercially. And however, share deal and company split would normally take longer due to the legal formalities requirements. Uh, but uh, what we need to consider if any special license would be required for the capital business, then transfer of the license in asset deal may take longer. And in some cases, the licenses cannot be transferred. Then the capital business would need to apply the new license in, instead. Then if that would be the case, the timing would be subject to the time used for the license application. And that could be quite different. Understood. Thank you, Jean. Yeah. Uh, there's there is one one question, uh, you know, for Bimal and Tarun. Uh, since uh, Bimal Tarun, you have uh, worked on several uh, uh, large complex carve outs. Uh, would you, uh, you know, can you can you talk about uh, what what kind of large issues that you know complications that uh, typically you would uh, kind of come across, uh, you know, uh, and maybe a little play around uh, and maybe a little. So, okay. Sir, you want to go sure. first, and then I can just add. You can give. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, sure. So I think uh, when we look at at large cross and especially large cross border and cross cross country cross cultural uh, um, transactions, I think one of the biggest issues is of course of course the fact that you have to deal with a whole uh, individual set of requirements in every country. There are there are regulatory requirements, there are taxation requirements, there are approvals required, and not every country would follow uh, a similar kind of a of a timeline in terms of those approvals. So we have to make the carve out plan, uh, keeping in in mind the various timelines uh, across different countries that would be required. The the second from a again from a very from a very tax perspective is the fact that uh, as as separate entities. There is a lot more uh, scrutiny and a lot more um, planning required across, you know, how cross cross border payments would would happen. Um, how um, we, so, 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 for example, if there is a TSA between a parent and a and, and a carved out business, then those are now intercompany payments. They are not internal payments, and many of these payments will be required to be done across the country, across borders. So there would be things like withholding taxes to keep in mind. Uh, so how do we plan around around all of those things? Um, carving out also would mean that individual taxes also for people of personal tax income taxes also get impacted. There are various filings required to be done. Just as an example, in India, you have um, uh, something called you know the uh, the provident fund, which is basically a retirees fund. So how do you manage manage all of those areas are also extremely important. Uh, so I think those are are some of the important aspects, uh, and the, I think the underlying factor that we see from a consulting point of view as well is is we are literally dealing with different cultures and different um, in in different countries. So keeping all of that that in mind and planning around that is something which I think are some of the complications that we have to plan for. Uh, Bimal, I think that just to add? add to what Tarun said, I think the two main areas that we find most complicated are also in addition to that is, is the human capital perspective, right? People, because usually carve outs and have uh, a huge element of people uh, and people don't like to leave organizations and the culture and some of them are kind of, you know, have been with the organizations in the past. So when there is a carve out and especially the carve out means you're coming out from one organization and then you'll be potentially taken into another organization. There is a huge amount of uh, people issues that, that come up and Tarun just sort of alluded provident fund. So those are kind of financial, but I think the cultural and uh, separation issues are high. Uh, the other one is, I think it's it's data and IT and systems. Um, IT and data, especially in regulated businesses, is very important where you can store what kind of data. So if you can think about a financial services business, um, you know, certain GDPR rules, uh, certain data you can't take out from certain countries. And most of these systems are kind of global systems. So when you carve out, uh, so let's say, and I was just giving you an example of a city business being carved out in just Asia or India, you have multiple global systems. What will happen to those systems using different parts of the business from origination to collections? 
So there are very huge amount of complexities also in in IT and IT systems, which which we need to take care of. Got it. So uh, I think uh, that's that's all we have time for today. Uh, Jean, Bimal, Karun, uh, thank you very much. And uh, special thanks to all of you who were able to join us. We would like to encourage you to fill out the short survey that will pop up on your screen uh, and tell us what you think about today's program. Uh, if you joined us late, please note that this presentation will be archived for future viewers. If you feel that others would benefit from this webcast, please share the webcast via the share this icon or have them visit the debrief website. We will respond to all questions submitted during the webcast in a couple of weeks. Uh, also, if you think of any questions or comments later, please uh, feel free to reach out uh, to me or any of our speakers. We'll be more than happy to talk to you. Uh, and please don't forget to tune into our next scheduled webcast uh, from the Corporate Income Tax Series on 31st of May, titled M&A and Coward Strategy in Southeast Asia. At last, from all of us at Deloitte, thank you for your participation in Deloitte Asia's uh, Asia Pacific Tax webcast today. Goodbye.